Okay. Welcome, uh, Dr. Louis Baringa. Thank okay. you. Take Thank from you. Ericsson Research. Yeah, so I come from the same organization as the Eva presented in the morning, uh, Security Research. And we have a small group there with five people working with how to use machine learning in security. And um, so she also mentioned that we work with uh, products, market, and with academia. So I come from the part that works with products a bit more. So what I want to present is uh, something we did with in collaboration with an operator, a real operator, and a product unit. Uh, so due to time, probably focus on the first part on a um, uh, very specific case, interconnection by passport. It's a big issue for many operators. And the second one probably I will mention briefly. Uh, some examples about fraud. Um, the first ones are mostly known. Uh, fraud is known as mainly for consumers. You have the case, for example, call 1G when you get a call. And curious users, they call back and suddenly they end up subscribing to some paid service. Or you get an SMS with a link or asking you to reply and you end up with paying a bill at the end of the month. So, or with all SIM cards, you know, they are easily cloned. They can be cloned. If somebody gets your card, they can now practically clone it and then use your card for abusing. So fraud is very well known for consumers, but probably what is not that well known is how fraud is done against opera operators themselves. And I've taken here two examples, interconnection bypass fraud and roaming fraud. So how to start with how serious this fraud is against operators. I, there is a survey that is done every year by an organization, and they ask all operators in the world how much they are losing money. And the latest figures we have from 2017 is 29 billion lost due to fraud. And on the right, you can see uh, how much is due to interconnection bypass. It's about 4 billion. And you see how, also how it has been developing over the years. And there is a decrease now in the, from 2005, 15, 2017, because operators, they are taking measures, of course, to, to fight fraud. Uh, but we don't know how it, I don't have the latest figures, but it could happen in the same effect as from the 2009, 2011. It may grow. It depends. So this is a serious issue. And we, in our group, we signed a collaboration with that European operator to study this problem. Um, I, I have included in the presentation a couple of links. You can go to, the, to some YouTube websites, and you can see how easily it is to make fraud today. Yes, and you can basically buy a box, install it in your house, and make money. But it, that is illegal. Yes. So um, I'll show one of these examples, the interconnection bypass fraud. And, uh, and I'm uh, sorry if I'm now talking money, economics, and business. Uh, it's an unavoidable in the case you talk about fraud. This, uh, so just to make simple the picture, uh, when you make an international call, it could be all GSM or it could be voice over IP uh, between operators, the, the money flow goes like, uh, as you said, the, the, the caller pays, for example, 35 cents. This is just an uh, hypothetical example. And how that money is distributed, and, and this can then we can use this for fraud analysis. The 35 cents are split in the service chain so that the, the, the operator where the, the call is originated keeps, for example, 5 cents only, and the rest is delivered to the so-called interconnect carrier. These are big backbones between operators. And so there is no billing directly from the operator A in country A to the terminating operator. The, the money sh is gone to the interconnection carrier. Now the carrier takes that money and uh, for, the, for an established call, once it's done, when at the end of the month we make the, the settlements of the billing, this interconnect carrier, it pays five cents to the, it keeps five cents and gives the rest to the country B operator. Uh, so most of the money is in the terminating side. Yes. And this applies to any type of uh, paid call. Yes. So where can you make fraud in this case? Where, where they also, the fraudsters, they also follow the money. Uh, what they have found is that uh, these this interconnect carriers, they appeared in the, from the GS, even the, in the telephony world, in the GSM, in 3GPP networks, as trusted actors. And they were supposed to behave well. But as time goes by and these interconnection carriers, they grow, 
now there are hundreds of, of them all over the world, and they join this interconnection world business. It's very difficult to con control them, and the trust model that was the original model, trust model, was built upon doesn't hold anymore, but the technology remains. The re technology that was done for interconnection was not built using advanced encryption or public key infrastructure. It was built on top of trust. I trust that you will do your work. What these interconnect carriers are doing, and they are meeting in Russia and Asia, what they do is they find ways to avoid the second part of the, the call. Yeah, so that when the call is originated in the country A, what they do is they deviate the, the route of the call and use voice over IP connections, which are best effort, internet connections, cheap ones, and they don't use the infrastructure that was built for good quality 3GPP calls, so good quality voice over IP. And these networks, the green part, they are built upon SLA agreements, contractual agreements, legal enforcement, privacy, security. So what they are doing, they're breaking the, the trust. They are not using the SLA, and they are using something else. Yes. And they deviate the call, and the payload, your voice, your data, is deviated through a cheap route. And this way, they don't pay the second part of the fee. They keep the money. Okay. So this is a big problem. This is happening now. Yes. And uh, of course, new networks, 5G networks, they are already building more secure interconnections. But we are living with legacy 3GPP networks, where this still happens and will still happen. So uh, I'll give you a more practical example of how this is done in practice. One of them is called Simbox. Uh, this, what well this, um, again, let me see if I can show here. Here, this uh, interconnect carrier, what they do is, one way of deviating the call is they trans transport the voice up to a so-called SIM box. And this SIM box has two legs. One leg is voice over IP, and the other leg is GSM or TGPP. Yes, it has a bunch of SIM boxes, radio stack. And what they do is they, they transport the, the voice up to the country, and in the country, they find people who can run these inboxes. And then with the voices, the inbox originates a call, a local call to the destination. Yes. So that uh, the, the, the person who is receiving the call, he will see a call coming from a local number. Yes, but it is originated in another country. Yes. So, and the split of the money, of course, in this case, the, the interconnect carrier will keep most of the money is still and will pay a local fee instead of paying the whole international fee. Yeah. So this is one type of... They exist, you can buy these in boxes on the internet uh, from Russia, you can install in your home and uh, start making money, but this is illegal. It's very easy to, to make it. Another type of more recent uh, interconnect bypass is called OTT bypass. And it's also similar, I mean, but in this case, the assumption compared to the previous case, here the, the person who is called may be connected over just the traditional 3GPP, not having an IP connection. So in that case, you must use the, a SIM card from the country. But in this case, that is more advanced. If this phone is connected over IP, and many users today have smartphones with an app inside. So this app, as soon as you turn your phone on and you start the app, it registers your number in this OTT box server in the cloud. So this operator here, it knows your telephone number and it knows your IP address. Yes. So what they do is they sign, I cannot mention the brands here, but you imagine voice over IP apps, there are many of them. So this interconnect carrier that is in fraudulent, well they, they sign agreements with this app, voice over IP operators. And whenever a, a call is coming from the left, they ask, I have a call coming to this telephone number in your country, in this country. Do you know if he's registered now online? Yes. And uh, this, this guy answers the service, and yes, I have it online, I know his IP address, then they call this carrier to IP. It terminates in the country. So this is complete fraud. In this case, the, the operator in country B doesn't make any money at all. Yes, and, but the connection is used to transport the call. So, so these are very uh, serious problems. So what we had um, 
uh, just to talk about the legislation now. What, what is happening now is that this interconnect carrier, it's, it's playing two roles here. On, on one side, he has a commitment to re regulation, to delivery calls, to legal, legal enforcement, service level agreements, security, privacy. But on the second part, he's violating the, the agreements and doing best effort, no privacy, in most cases, no security. There is no help desk. Uh, one of the results of this deviation of calls is that uh, the voice quality is affected on the B side, on the second side, and users are complaining and they don't call the, the OTT operator, they call the originating operator. Yes. So having this in mind, what we signed an agreement with an operator to how can we detect this case, this inbox case. Yes. Um, just to mention a bit, uh, we had, um, sorry here, uh, operators today, to detect the SIM boxes, they use uh, companies, they are, they are called call centers. And there is, there is an easy way to detect them, yes. If you have two telephones, one in, in, one, in both, uh, one in each country, if the phone call goes through the trusted path, you will see that in the, in the, in the phone B in this country that the call is originated in another country, yes. But if you can control both phones, and the call went through the fraudulent path, you will see a local number. So that's an easy way to detect if there is fraud or not. Yes. So there are companies who offer such services. Uh, operators buy from them. And if every month they tell, can you detect uh, if there are SIM boxes in my network? And these companies just make a call many numbers and then they detect SIM cards that are being abused. Yes. But this process is very expensive. Uh, each call costs $10. It's manual, yes, uh, you have to do it all, all manual procedures. So what we, we got, uh, this, this was the challenge for us. Can we do something against this? Can we, this? can we use machine learning to detect this type of fraud? And if we do that, we could reduce the, the cost for detecting them. We can do automation. And um, so uh, from our research group, it was interesting to see what algorithms are best for this type of problems. And can we use it in production? Can we automate uh, uh, blocking the SIM cards that are being abused? There is previous work. Uh, AT&T in the US, they, they made a similar uh, previous studies, but in the, in the report, we found that they didn't report exact figures about the performance of their algorithms. They didn't list it, uh, all the features that they, they had used. So, and we had many ideas about which features could be used to detect fraud. There is also another from the university that also made a study on this, how to detect SIM calls, the SIM box. And they were using quality, um, checking the quality of the voice calls. So that, that, that's intrusive. You need to install equipment in the network. So what we did is uh, using the data that operators could get from the ground truth, let's say, from, from these companies, um, we use also as input CDR. CDR stands for call detail records that gives information on who calls to whom, when, how long, which base station was used. And we built a platform, machine learning platform here in, in our labs with uh, analytics for detecting fraud. Um, then we also, this is the probably the most interesting part of machine learning or machine internet. What features can you use to detect fraud? And uh, Let's give an example. If you compare a, a classical phone, a smartphone with a SIM, and you compare a SIM box here, it's a bunch, many hundreds of cards. Then you can start thinking, well, what, what, what makes them different? Yes. Uh, if you know the, the phones, they have an identity that is called EMEI here. Yes. And there is also the SIM card also has an identity. And base stations also have an identity. So the three very interesting parameters to work with. So we started speculating what can, be, can we use as features. And, if you compare with a SIM box, these this boxes, they have no friends. Yes, and nobody calls them, for example. They only make outgoing calls. So one interesting feature was a uh, number of the different outgoing calls. How many calls does this box receive? They don't receive calls. They only originate calls. Um, in the phone example, you can see there is one SIM. Usually, there is only one, one or two SIM cards that are bound to a phone ID. In this, in this case, you have hundreds of SIM cards 
tied to a one phone ID. That's another interesting feature to study. Um, usually you have, say, how many friends do you call during the day? One, two, three, four, ten maybe, but this inbox they call hundreds of people. So we made a very long list of features. Yes, You also wanted to have from the operator access to the customer profiles to be able to check fidelity contact, but it was not possible. So we limit our study to this data coming in, in the records. And yeah, we came to this, our results here. So we, we study a lot of algorithms for fraud, uh, unsupervised and supervised, and the best one that we found for this case was random forest. Uh, we listed many features and checked them and weighted them, and at the end of the day, we found that 15 features were the most interesting. Some of them you saw in the previous slides. As we trained data during many days, and for example, we found that as the longer, this is intuitive, the longer you train, or the best your algorithm performed, but after six days, uh, the, the performance was just flattening, so there is no need to train more than seven days. Yes. So that that's uh, one of the results from this research. Uh, I think uh, how is with timing? I probably need to, um, okay, briefly about another case for fraud. Uh, this is also very interesting. Uh, we have today you can buy on the market. And they, are, they look like phones, but they have two legs, the cellular leg and the Wi-Fi leg. And what you can, for example, if a businessman from Asia comes to Europe, why they, they bring this type of phones? And what they do is, when they are in the hotel, they turn it on, and these devices are so intelligent using a Wi-Fi connection and the cellular connection. They say, "Where am I? I am in, for example, in Sweden." And then this phone reports that over Wi-Fi to a SIM as a service for example, in Asia, and say, I am actually in Sweden. Can you give me a SIM card from Sweden? That's basically the service. So this service here sends information about SIM, not the key, the key is impossible to get, but the identity of a subscriber in the SIM card. And then this one starts attaching to the local network using one of the Swedish SIM cards somewhere in Asia. It downloads a profile, it does the connection, and it suddenly it works like a normal phone. Yes, and then this businessman, they can use the, this device as a Wi-Fi hotspot wherever they are in all over the world. Whether this is fraud or not, that depends on jurisdiction, and that depends on the legal framework. But in many countries, this is illegal, yes, including Europe. So what we did, we made an analysis of the radio signaling. We don't need to go into details, and we found that the most interesting feature to to look at is how long the authentication takes from the phone to the radio network here. Yes. Normally, th this is the, the signaling is local in the country, so you can measure in time of s milliseconds. But if the signaling now in this case is proxied back to Asia, it would go up to second. So it needs to go to a SIM service in the uh, outside Europe. So uh, we also are testing other features, but this is probably the most interesting one. And then we made uh, measurements using operator data. You can see here more to get an idea. The average authentication time is around 250 milliseconds. But when you have this type of uh, SIM as a service, it can go up to one second. Yes. So for this, we also, so far, we're only using one feature or two, but um, and we also observed that it's a high level of switching between SIM cards and EM EMEI equipment. So those are the two cases that uh, where we find uh, interesting applying these machine learning techniques. And uh, to conclude, um, due to time, I have four conclusions here. The, I think we have to live with legacy infrastructure, and probably machine learning is useful for that. Yes. You cannot correct the technical basis behind interconnect, but you can use machine learning to detect fraud. Um, there are new players coming into the interconnect business, and they are not and that's difficult to control. So new networks will solve that problem, but we still need to live with the old ones. Uh, in, in the figures for performance, uh, we didn't have 100% uh, accuracy when detecting fraud. So uh, our goal was to automate 100%. So ideally, machine learning detects fraud, and automatically the SIM cards some via some API can block the SIM card. It was impossible to do. They still need some. We were able to detect most of them, but still, the 
people in the fraud department need to analyze some of the cases separately. So there is some manual work. And the last one is, we noticed this is kind of funny, that uh, there is an arms race, or we can say feature race, between fraudsters and we researchers. As soon as we find a new feature to stop fraud, they, they see that SIM card is blocked, and they say, what happened? They, they try to figure out what, what is it that we did to block them. So they try to avoid them. For example, the, if we use the cell ID, the base station ID, where the SIM box is connected, what they do is they move the SIM box to another place. Yes. So that they, they avoid that one. Or they, uh, they are faking the device ID as well. So they, they, there is no, the number of SIM cards tied to one equipment, you don't see that anymore in the feature. Yes. They just invent device IDs. Yes. So they are also following probably us here and seeing what is new that we are inventing so they can avoid it. So it's an arm race and it's, it's going on. So that's it, uh, end of my talk. Thank you very much, Louis. Okay. So um, any questions to Louis? No, I, it just, this arm race, uh, I work with the SIM uh, lock uh, issues in the 3G. Oh. Uh, enrollment, uh, it was very much the same thing. You, exactly. you enhanced the security and they, uh, they had new routes. Exactly. Thank you very much. An applaud for Louis. Okay.